Hello? Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Immutable and Reproducible Software Track at Scale21x. Our next talk is going to be Nix the Planet by Matthew Krogan. Uh, and with that, Matthew, please take it away. Okay. So this, co this talk is called Nix the Planet. And I'm going to try and convince you that using Nix at home and at work is a good idea. Who am I? My name is Matt, Matthew Krogan, and I am a Nix slash NixOS slash Nix packages contributor. I run my own software consultancy called Nix.how, which teaches you how to use Nix. And uh, you know, if you've got problems, I'll solve them. You can pay me. I also have a project called Nixified AI, which is about making AI reproducible and easy to use with a single Nix command. I run Nix Camp, which is a yearly event, usually in the UK. Uh, where a bunch of Nix people get together, have fun, sleep in the same building, and sprint on Nix projects. Here's some pictures from 2023. You might see a few familiar faces there. Some of the people from Scale come along. And that's where I first met people from Scale, and they told me to come here and uh, give talks. And that's the wheelie pad. It's an iPad on a stick. And then it walks around and talks to people. And you can get a surprising amount of work done that way. Here's one of my favorite people sporting the Nix lab coat. And uh, there's some people in this room also wearing the same lab coat, which I gave out as a gift to people at Nix camp one year. So I think it's fair to say that I'm a bit of a Nixaholic. But honestly, Nix has changed my life. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Nix. So please, just try the goddamn Nix. So why should you try Nix? I don't know about you personally, well, I'm going to tell you some of the things I've done with Nix, and hopefully that will inspire you and get, get your creative juices running, and you can come up with some of your own ideas for what Nix is useful for. So one of my favorite things to do is take software that doesn't compile, usually academic, it was never intended to run anywhere else, and make it run everywhere. And it's a, in some respects, it's a waste of time, but I don't know, it feels good to make something that didn't work, work again. And uh, usually the authors appreciate that too. I've also uh, been playing around with mobile NixOS, which is NixOS on a phone. And this is what it looks like plugged into an external monitor with a Bluetooth keyboard attached. Here's what it looks like in more of a travel setup. Uh, I also use Nix to build my Android phone using Robotnix, which is a library written purely in Nix for building Android from source. And of course, I manage my laptop, my phone, my servers, everything is Nix. The network that you're all running on right now is also powered by Nix. More and more every year. I don't think it was 18% last year, but it is this year. And you can see that the, the dominating language there is Perl. I don't know if that's a good idea, but it, it's what we have, and we're slowly converting it to Nix. And all of these kiosk machines that you've seen around showing the schedule, right? That's 100% Nix. So it's a repo on GitHub. You do a single Nix build command, and it produces an SD image that you flash to a Pi, and then you get the scale uh, kiosks. I've also been working with someone in this room called Nova on a project called Stardust XR. So what is Stardust XR? It's a display server that is not Wayland. It's not Arcan. It's its own unique and new thing. It's written purely in Rust, and I've been making Nix expressions that allow you to run this uh, easily on your own computer. I also ended up making the CI for the project. Now, the CI for this project, I think, is a work of art. Not just because I made it, but because Nix empowered me to do so, so easily. So what it does, this CI system for Stardust, is it uses Nix to make it so that you can, with a single command, independently verify that the whole software stack works, because there's multiple components here. There's the display server that you're interacting with that isn't Stardust, for example, Wayland or Gnome, which Stardust can also run inside of. There is this piece of software called Monado, which takes numbers from the headset. People write drivers to get numbers from the gyroscope, etc., and send it to the display server. There's a lot of software running all over the place. Um, it's a big stack. So I wrote a VM test in 150 lines of Nix, which uh, deploys GNOME inside of a VM, uh, and then runs all of this software in tandem, and then takes a screenshot 
and it only takes 27 seconds to run. So then I took that even further and said, okay, well, what if every single time Nova makes a change to the repository, a change to the tech stack, I'm going to do the same thing, but then I'm going to post the screenshot to a Discord channel so they can see if they broke something. And so that's, that's some of the stuff I've been working on that I find quite cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so what Stardust empowers you to do is use these glasses, which if anyone wants to try them out, you can after the talk. You put these things on, and then you get a 1080p display. And it's pretty usable, and I think you'll be surprised if you do decide to try it out. And they only cost 200 euros. So I think something like this is the future of portable computing. Imagine if the uh, glasses themselves contained the compute, and then all you have to do is walk around with these things. So I've been putting these glasses to work with mobile NixOS because now I've got a phone that's running a full Linux operating system with a reproducible user space that I can walk around with, with my glasses and the phone in the pocket, and I think that's cool. Some other experiments include... Oh, hold on. There we go. The head pewter. <laughs> Now, in my opinion, this one was not the most comfortable. You can see we're using FreeCAD on the phone there, and I don't want to do my work like this. The key pewter, now that's interesting. So that's a Raspberry Pi 400 with the, just the glasses. Right? So now all you need is the keyboard and the glasses. And by the way, on the Nix phone, we can just run Android. So I've got Linux and Android all in one. And how do I do that? Well, it's a single line of Nix configuration. I've also been empowered to use Nix on Android, and since I'm in California, I thought I'd put the, uh, the president on the screen. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just completely addicted to Nix, and I can't stop, and none of you are going to be able to stop me. <laughs> so, the people in the room that have never heard of Nix are probably wondering, what is Nix? And the answer is, it's not this. Does that make sense? No. So these are um, the shared objects which your programs are linked to, and they just use version numbers. But if you use a version number, maybe you'll have a conflict because this is a human contract. But if you use Nix, you don't get a human contract, you get hashes which define the content of these uh, shared objects. So you can have as many versions of anything that you want on your system all at once, and nothing can possibly ever conflict. So that's Nix in a nutshell. That's one of its properties. But most importantly, Nix is just a language which looks a bit like this. You've got search, you've got dictionaries, effectively. You've got um, all sorts of data types, and it's a Turing-complete domain-specific language. But this is what it looks like in action, right? So this is, I think, the best example I could give to show you how it looks like a Docker file. So you have this function on line 8 called run command. And run command takes a few arguments. The first argument it takes is a string. And the second argument it takes is an attribute set. And the third argument it takes is a multi-line string with these double single quotes. And what this, der what this recipe or Docker file lookalike, or we call it a derivation, is doing is it's isolating the computation that you want to perform into a small, succinct, reproducible chunk. So I can do just about anything. Like I can pull in Firefox just to run the minus minus help and then put that in the output. And in order to do that, it will go ahead and it will fetch Firefox source code. It will compile Firefox from source. And if it needs to bootstrap GCC, it will do that too. And yeah, it's, it's infinitely composable, infinitely powerful. All right, so that's Nix, but what about Nix OS? So Nix OS does the same thing for operating systems and not just small artifacts, right? So you can see here, I've enabled Nginx, I've enabled OpenSSH, I want to use the latest kernel, I want to use systemd boot, and I want a user on the system called Matthew with this password. And that means that I have full control. This is very different from other 
um, deployment tools or other build systems, right? They usually leave some information out. They usually have something you can't control, something you have to base everything on top of. But with Nix and Nix OS, I can control the bootloader, the kernel, and the programs inside. And if we want to someday, and I think, in fact, some people are, uh, they're, they're building the, the BIOS from source, so they're going even lower level. At some point, maybe we can build the microcode. Who knows? Right? We can keep going. And that's what Nix is all about. It's all about reproducibility. Yeah, and all of this software is compiled from source, but thanks to a fancy trick called substitution, it allows us to ask the world if somebody else has built this software for us already and get it from them because it's reproducible and we trust them, so we just get it. We don't need to build it ourselves. Gen2, for example, I'm not sure has such a caching mechanism, which is why it's much slower and much uh, more cumbersome. Okay, so what is Nix Packages? Nix Packages is just a repo on GitHub, and it contains all of the uh, derivations or recipes for 100,000 plus software packages, and they all work correctly. These are not packages that you're going to install and hope that they install correctly. They simply exist, and you can grab them at any time. And they work, and they're well tested. Yeah, they're, they're as up to date as they can be, and there's a lot of automation and bots in Nix packages that keep things up to date without human intervention. Yeah, and uh, the contributor list is growing. And of course, this is easier to contribute to than almost any other distribution. You simply fork the GitHub repo, make a small change, make a pull request, and it's done. Other distributions of Linux don't work quite that way. So with all of that in mind, you end up with the declarative trinity, which is the operating system, the language, and the package manager. Nix is a lot of things. It's primarily these three things. So let me give you a short history of Nix. So it all starts in 2002, before Nix, when this paper, Why Order Matters, Turing Equivalence and Automated Systems Administration, demonstrates how to use the existing deployment tools to achieve a sort of um, Nix-like feel for deploying your systems where everything is as you defined. And it coined the terms divergent, convergent, and congruent deployment. So if we look at divergent deployment, this is what most systems in the real world look like, which is where someone uses their fingers on a keyboard over SSH to affect a system manually by hand. If we look at convergence, this is what applying an Ansible playbook might look like, where you start on Ubuntu, but if you apply the playbook, then you'll get what you want, and then maybe the system accumulates some state over time, and then you nuke it, and then you apply the playbook again, and you're eventually just going to get to where you want to be. But congruent deployment is when you actually define how you want the system to look, and you actually get the system that you asked for. And that is the deployment methodology that Nix enforces. So this is the timeline. In 2003, Elko invented Nix, and the first papers on Nix were released in 2004, the Nix thesis in 2006, and then Armin Hemmel in 2006 released Nix OS and it's surely going to take over the world. In 2021, we had 1,700 contributors, 292,000 commits. In 2022, we had 4,700 contributors and double the amount of commits. And in 2024, it's still going, and it shows no signs of stopping. So how long before we get here? <laughs> Repology.org has a great graph which shows Nix packages in the lead of fresh, up-to-date packages, way ahead of Arch Linux, for example, as hard as they might try. And this small cluster in the bottom left is just about every other Linux distribution out there. I'm not aware of any larger package repository on the internet. So what is it that Nix actually achieves? So if you like any of these buzzwords, then you'll be happy with Nix, because Nix allows you to define your infrastructure as code, it guarantees reproducibility, it can give you software supply chain security that is much superior to other methodologies, and you can, out of a Nixos configuration, for example, uh, derive a software bill of materials that you could hand off to somebody. And it is also an accurate software bill of materials, right? Because a lot of these 
other tools like Docker, for example, they are powerless to give you a software bill of materials. So people try very hard to like inspect the layers and give you answers as to what's on the path, what's actually inside, what binaries are inside of the, the container. But uh, really, they're just guessing that it wasn't by construction, the metadata was not there. They had to go in and recover that metadata. Yeah, so Nix is primarily a methodology and a great community of thousands and thousands of people. It's a really big open source community. And you can just go into the online channels and ask for help, and they'll give you it. And that's really the, the killer feature, in my view, of what Nix does and what it is. But NixOS is not the only one, because Nix is just, as I've described, a language. There are other operating systems that use Nix as the language to produce their output, such as Liminix, which is a replacement for OpenWRT-style router firmware. Uh, there is NotOS by Clever CA22, which is just a Nix expression that produces an operating system that isn't NixOS and doesn't use systemd. And there is VPS Admin OS, which is a lightweight host for system containers. It wants to do things like uh, declare the ZFS um, data sets, for example, and uh, manage those. And also not target NixOS and be able to run all sorts of other distributions in containers declaratively by using Nix. And that's what, yeah, that's what VPS Admin OS does. There's also Geeks, which is not Nix. And there's also Tvix by TVL. So it's clear that the future is declarative and the future is functional. And we need something like Nix because software is complex. This is the dependency graph of Firefox on the bottom right. But that was in 2003 when Elko wrote the thesis. We also need Nix because DevOps is so easy. Look at all these tools you can use. <laughs> this is commonplace. We're going to use Docker, and we're going to use, in the Docker file, we're going to use Ansible to provision Puppet, which is then going to configure Helm. It's going to install Chef imperatively. Then it's going to configure Podman, and Podman's used to deploy XTeddy at scale. And it's like, I don't want to do that. Right. Less humorous. Who's using Nix? So clear path rope. Oh, well, it wasn't a question as to who's using it. <laughs> right. So, so uh, the, who is using Nix? Uh, in the real world. So we got Cleopath Robotics, who are making overlays for Nix. We got Anderil, who's making overlays for uh, the NVIDIA hardware boards. We've got people doing biology with Nix, and we've got particle accelerators running Nix. Quite concerning, because they keep coming back to Nixcon with more news to report about how they're using it with the particle accelerators. One day they may make a black hole, and we'll all be consumed. <laughs> So I alluded earlier to uh, the fact that my phone is running NixOS. The phone only cost $150 or 100 euros or something like that. It was released in 2018, and it's got 10 gigs of RAM, and it's not obsolete. So mobile.nixos.org is a website you can go to to learn more about this. But I can tell you that a lot of the work that is done to make this happen is actually inherited from post-market OS. So if you want to donate money, a lot of money should really go to those guys to uh, continue that effort. Uh, Samuel DR, who's a Nix community member and a developer, has been successful in booting the Linux kernel and running Nix OS on an Asus ZenWatch. And this is the amount of code difference that is required to actually get Linux and Nix OS on my phone. This is in a, uh, the diff between uh, my, my existing Nix OS configuration and what I had to do to, to, to make my phone boot NixOS. So it's not very much, right? It, it, it looks quite simple in the end. I, I add mobile NixOS on the input, and then on line 20, I refer to it as being required for one of the outputs. And on line 28, I say, my phone is the result of a single Nix function call, and it's an ARM64 Linux machine, and I'm going to import these Nix files, which define the software I want to run, and that's it, right? So. Nix is a language, and it has functions in it which produce whole operating systems, and it's very easy. SXMO is the uh, name of the uh, graphical user interface and desktop environment that I'm using on the phone. I'll give you a demo of this soon. Yeah. So 
So has anyone seen this film? Yeah, hackers. The guy on the right is called The Plague. He's the enemy of the film, but I'm quoting him because I actually, I actually believe in this quote. There is no right and wrong, only fun and boring. And you know what's boring? Ubuntu Pro. <laughs> Ubuntu just recently started charging for security updates. And the Snap Store got infected with a Bitcoin wallet that didn't actually get published by the original author of that Bitcoin wallet because anyone can just add stuff to it and people can download it and then they can get infected. So it's not, they're copying the worst practices of Microsoft and Apple and it just doesn't feel right to me. It's boring. It's not, it doesn't sound like very much fun. Docker has gone pro and they can build my containers up to 39 times faster. I don't know how they came to that number, but yeah, boring. And I reported this on the Docker Hub three years ago, but it's still up. Xteddy for Mac, that's a virus. So Docker's bad, right? Here's why it's bad if no one knows. So this Docker file just says from Ubuntu latest. And then it just gets Ubuntu from somewhere and then it runs app get update. So now tomorrow when you build the container it's gonna be different. And then you apt install, hello, and then everything's great. But no one can reproduce this because nothing was pinned. And Docker files and the Docker build kit stuff does not actually allow, it, it doesn't give you an expression language to prevent these mistakes. Whereas what Nix does is it won't allow you to use latest. It won't allow you to use ambiguous revisions of things or tags. It just, uh, it's a domain specific language that prevents you from making mistakes. And that's why I like it. What now? I thought I like Docker. I still want to use it. That's okay, you can, because Docker has a Nix fetish, as it turns out. <laughs> so at DockerCon 2023, it turns out that there's this talk with Tom Berrick from Flux, who's a member of the Nix community and a developer. Uh, they're actually thinking about using Nix internally inside of Docker as a, as a debugging tool. And it's only gonna get worse from there because they're gonna find out at some point that they don't even need Docker. So. <laughs> and uh, there was a talk at NixCon here in LA uh, that Nix is a better Docker image builder than Docker's image builder, which is true. So Docker is two things, right? It's the Docker build kit, which defines these Docker files, and it's uh, the container runtime. It's the thing that executes the namespace and does the, the Linuxy stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so Nix is great, right? What are the downsides? So the first and most important downside is that you've got to learn something new. And Linux file systems once looked like this, and now they don't. They look like this, right? Another uh, troubling problem with Nix is the fact that you can have experts who write Nix code in one particular fashion, and then you have another type of Nix user who writes it in a completely different fashion, which results in this. Okay? And so with that, I think that's the end of the first part of my talk, and we're just gonna get to the demos. Okay. Right, so the first thing I'm gonna show you guys is how to configure a NixOS system, just in case people don't know. I'm gonna mirror my screen. So I have this service that I made, which is a five-line shell script, which spawns a VM, a NixOS VM, statelessly. If anyone else wants to do this, the uh, one sec. You can go to that and you can spin up a VM of your own and play around. The password is I hate Nix. <laughs> so configuring a NixOS machine is as simple as this. I don't have Vim, so I'll get it. And once we got Vim, we're gonna edit that configuration file and we're gonna define our operating system the way that we wanna see it. 
you know, I want to enable a service, a web server, some complicated thing. And what service do I want to enable? Well, I don't know what services exist, so I'm going to go to search.nixos.org. I'm going to ask, can I deploy Vault Warden? Looks like I can. The option exists. I can enable it. So let's try doing that. So services dot vault warden dot enable equals true. We're going to save that, and then I'm going to do a Nixos rebuild switch. And then what I've asked for is going to become true. And then we're going to use a proxy to get in there, and you can all go to it on your phones, and it's all going to work flawlessly. And then I'm going to be able to comment it out, because the op whole operating system is code, and then that removes it. It's not available anymore. So Nix is very much like a compiler. You use GCC on your C code, and it produces an object file, and you can execute that object file. Nix does the same thing, but for operating systems, it's the whole uh, the, the Nix expression results in a whole Unix operating system with all the behavior that you want defined and, and present inside. Yeah. Any questions? No. Am I doing a good job? <laughs> yeah, so some of the network based things can take a little time to, to demonstrate. Let me see what else I got in store for you guys. Okay, how about the dev shell from hell? Okay, <laughs> I'll do that in a minute. Okay, so Vault Warden is deployed. We can see it's there because if we use netstats, we can see Vault Warden is listening on port 8222, and we can get in there using a nice utility called bore CLI, which is a reverse proxy. And now I can access the service here. And Vault Warden is deployed. And everyone can reach it and use it and be happy. And then I can just comment it out of my configuration like this. And do another Nixos rebuild switch. And then it will go away. But on all of the users that were there on the system, in the etc past wd file, they go away too. Everything gets cleaned up, and we're happy. Right. In the meantime, how about we do the dev shell from hell on a powerful server? So on the bottom right, I'm going to define a, a dev shell from scratch. So let's say you're working on the worst Rust project, or the worst .NET project, or the worst whatever project, and they use outdated dependencies, or they use a mixture of tool chains. I'm going to show you how with a flake.nix, you can define everything in Nix, and give this file to your coworkers, and get them up and running with the exact same environment as you. So the first thing we have to do in Nix is define a flake. And we have to say where we're going to get Nix packages from. So we say we're going to get it from GitHub, we're going to go to the NixOS user, we're going to go to the Nix packages repository, and we're going to get the NixOS unstable branch. And our Flake's going to have some outputs. The outputs are going to use Nix packages. And then we're going to say we've got a dev shell for x86 Linux. And it's going to be called dev shell. Well, we're going to call it default, the default dev shell. And it's going to be the result of a single Nix function call. Nix packages dot legacy packages. I'm going to clean this up later. x86 Linux dot mk shell. mk shell is the name of the function. And the function takes some arguments, build inputs, a list of packages. And what packages do we want? Well, maybe we want the JDK. 
And then we, maybe we also need something like .NET. And my employer is forcing me to use Cargo or something. And not that that's a bad tool, but you know, you get. I'm just trying to think of things that people might not like. Uh, what's that? Pearl. Yeah, Pearl. Well, it, Pearl's kind of everywhere. It's, <laughs> it's already there, so you don't need it. Um, they also want me to go on Zoom. So I'm going to get the Zoom <laughs> package. <laughs> yeah. Right. So this looks a bit ugly, right? Because it's got like legacy packages everywhere and like, yeah. So we're going to define a variable in the next language to get rid of all of that ugly little place. So let in packages equals this string. And now we can get rid of it wherever it occurs. And we can now say with packages, and now everything's nice and easy. And the language server there, you saw, help me out, because Nix is a fully featured language, and it has a language server and a good ecosystem of tools to deal with it. Right. So someone said Zoom US is marked as insecure, is that right? Right. So let's get Zoom US. This is going to fail. But the first thing we need to do is Nix Flake Show. Because what we just defined is not actually reproducible. Because we refer to Nix OS unstable, which could change in the next five minutes because someone could push to it. So when I do this Nix Flake Show command, it's going to generate a lock file, which gathers all of the facts at the point that I ran the Nix command. And then that's going to be stored in a lock file so that someone else in the future who comes along will get the same results as me. And if the internet changes and files change, then it won't try to reproduce it because it knows it's not going to get the same results. But yeah, I'm definitely not showing off the performance properties of Nix at the moment. <laughs> I'll do some VM tests shortly. Any questions so far? Uh, anyone got questions about the language or... Uh, Uh, I don't know. I think uh, decompression of Nix packages right now. Anyone got a faster machine? <laughs> what's, the, what's your preferred way of like um, collecting like uh, quote unquote garbage? Basically, like uh, previous generations that you don't need anymore, like to mi minimize the amount of storage that you that you need to store like Nix, Nix generation. Yeah. So so Nix has a garbage collector. And what that means is that files that are no longer referred to in the system get collected because you have this slash nix slash store and everything is in it. And if my system doesn't refer to Zoom anymore because I didn't put it in my nix OS configuration, I can do nix collect garbage minus D and it will just get rid of Zoom from the disk. You can just run that every night. There's also a nix uh, heuristic GC which is a garbage collector that has heuristics. And it's not just going to get rid of things that aren't referred to anymore. It's going to do more complicated things, like uh, delete the things that were added in the, in the past five days uh, that are the biggest, or something like this. You can define your own heuristic. It's a, it's a nice project. So yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Whenever this happens, I just p kill minus 9 nix. I don't know what's going on there. Well, you know what? Maybe this machine's having a bad day, so I'm going to go into a different machine. And thanks to Nix, I can just copy the file over. Come on. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I guess this is a fresh system with nothing on it. I'm not used to that. OK, so now let's do a Nick Flake show here and see how slow it is there. It's always good to have backups. Yeah, maybe I should move on to another demo in the meantime. Sorry for the context switching, guys. 
Okay, uh, what about a Nix OS test? So in Nix packages, we have these VM tests. Okay, there we go. So uh, I'll go back to that in a moment. So in Nix packages, we have VM tests. And what that means is that we can define, use Nix to define that we want a uh, virtual machine with a bunch of behavior and that we want to make an assertion that something happens or doesn't happen. I'm producing an exit code of one or zero depending on whether it happened or whether it didn't happen. So let me show you some of these tests. Okay, so we got how many tests? Yes, yeah, it's quite a lot of tests. So we got tests for like NFS, we got tests for the Linux kernel, we got tests for GNOME, tests for various things. Uh, one of my favorites, which I wrote, is Node Red. So it's a NixOS test, and it's going to name, it's going to maintainer, and these are the two VMs that we're going to run. And we've got a test script that says what we want to happen. So we're going to start all the VMs, we're going to wait for Node Red to start, we're going to wait for this port to be open, and if any of this fails, then it's going to fail the test which means that whenever this package gets updated in next packages, it runs, and we know what's going on. So to run that test, I just say mix build on that file, and yeah, it'll spin up a whole VM. And in order to do that, it will obviously compile the kernel if it needs to, it'll do all the stuff. But it's already been cached. <laughs> it already got ran before, so I gotta rebuild it, because I ran it last week. Yeah, uh, whilst that runs in the background, I guess I can deploy NixOS anywhere, which is the main attraction here. And that's when you take uh, other distributions and you turn them into NixOS. <laughs> right, whilst that goes on. So NixOS Anywhere has uh, demos and examples. So I'm going to clone the examples repo from GitHub. So this is just a basic template. It's going to install Grub on a VM in the cloud. It's going to enable OpenSSH on it. It wants me to change the authorized keys. Um, whoops. <laughs> These are my SSH keys. I'm going to put that in there. And NixOS Anywhere comes with a disk configuration, which defines how I want the disk to be laid out. Right? It's uh, using a project called Disco to do this, which is a bit like a systemd repart, which allows you to define a declarative disk configuration for all the partitions, the contents of those partitions, the files that are going to be on them, etc. So for example, we could change this. Instead of using ext4, we're going to use bcachefs because that's all the rage these days. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to specify that I want the Linux kernel to be the latest one because that's the kernel that contains bcachefs. But how do I know what the version of the kernel is? Well, I'm going to load the Nix REPL. I'm going to load the flake using colon LF. And then I'm going to inspect the inputs.nixospackages.revision. I'm also going to inspect the Nixos configurations that exist in this template. There's one for Hetzna Cloud. And it's got a config, boot kernel. Dot version. OK, there's a conflict. Something else is trying to set it. So I'll force it. And do that again. Kernel.version. 
6.5, right, so that's not late enough for Bcache FS, so we've got to update next packages. So let's do that. We're going to change the next packages we're using to next OS unstable. Do the next like show. It's updated. We've got the new revision, that's what we're going to use. And now I'm going to go to Hetzner. I'm going to buy a, a, a server. What do I have to do? Uh, type. I have to say how expensive it is. Okay. Nine euros a month sounds good to me. Okay, we got an IP address. But I selected Ubuntu. But Nixos Anywhere is going to turn this into a NixOS machine for me. Let's get in the console. Here it is, Ubuntu. I can't do anything with this. So let's turn it into NixOS, shall we? I actually forget the invocation. Yeah, it's a... Uh, here it is. Yeah. yeah. But, I don't want to do it without running a VM test first because I might screw up the server. So I'm going to add the VM test command line. And one of the inherent properties of Nixos Anywhere is that it defines a VM test for your server before it tries to deploy it. And uh, we can run that with the dash dash VM test flag right here. But yes, in the meantime, whilst that does its thing, our VM test for node red run. So let's rebuild it again. And we can run this VM test as many times as we like. And it's going to run the whole of NixOS and the services defined inside of the VM test. This is, two, this is a client running curl and a web server running Node-RED. And yeah, it's just testing that everything works, two VMs at once. And if we modify the test, we can make it fail. We can say we're going to use 1881. We've got the port number wrong. There's going to be nothing running on that uh, port. No, because it will still fail. Okay. Yeah. All right, in order to do that, modify the, the, the Python script. Runs the VMs. And then it's not going to finish. It's just going to hang around for a while until it times out. Ah, in fact, then we can see that the firewall is on on port 1881 in the, the server VM, and we know uh, what's going wrong. OK, the VM test passed for Nixos Anywhere, and now we're going to actually deploy it. Asking for my SSH key, I hit go. And now on the bottom left, the Hetzner server is going to react. Machine's going to boot into NixOS in six seconds. Boom, next OS. <laughs> but it isn't done yet. Okay, so it's going to go and uh, copy Nick's store paths from my laptop where the server is being built to the server. It's going to provision the disk with Disco, and then it's going to reboot, and we're going to be in a uh, Bcache FS enabled Nick's OS machine. Uh, I'm getting the, the, the time warning, so I guess I'll show you the Nix phone too. So, yeah, this is a Nix phone. Okay, let's rotate the screen. 
and we can run Blender on this thing. It's, it's really powerful. And all the graphical acceleration is working. And if you guys want to try this out, you can. I'll show you it later. We're in a game of Super Mario 64. Yeah, I'm speedrunning now. So. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, and uh, it's not just that that it can do, because it can also run... Uh, Wadroid. So we can run Android in a container. Oh, it's a show full UI. That's the name of the command. See lineage booting on the right there? It's the real deal. And it's got multi-touch enabled and everything, right? So works like a real phone. You see my uh, debug points there. The sound works. You can pass GPS through. I used this in Thailand to use Bolt whilst I was there. And then I swipe to the right, and I'm back in full NixOS. Terminal, swipe up to get the keyboard. It's good. It's fun. Yeah. And I guess that's it, because my time's out. But uh, <laughs> Sorry about that, Matthew. I thought we were supposed to end at 4, 4, uh, 4.45, but apparently it's 4.30. So, um, but yeah, I suppose do you want to meet outside it? Yeah, if anyone wants to speak to me outside or get more demos, because there's just far too much to demonstrate and uh, not enough time to do it with. Because last year I had a two-hour presentation, and that was crazy. So, like, yeah, just hit me up, come talk to me, and uh, hang out. Yeah. Well, thank you again, everyone. Thank, thank you, Matthew. Uh, we're going to start the next session in 15 minutes uh, with Pietro talking about immutability and atom atomicity in Linux. So stick around. My mistake, the next talk's in half an hour. Uh, hello? I've been informed that there's more time to talk, so I'm just going to show off a repo. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to run it. I can show you guys outside of the room because it might take a little time. But it's called Nix the Planet, right? That's the name of the repo. And what it does is it runs macOS in a single Nix command. And how does it do that? Right, it goes to Apple and it downloads the macOS installer. And then it boots the macOS installer in a Nix derivation. And then it takes screenshots every 10 seconds. <laughs> and it converts them to text using Tesseract. 
And then, when the expected text appears on the screen, I mean, we've got like, uh, we got a mouse jiggler, we got a power off wrapper, we got, like, we got all sorts of things, right? Um, right, so when the expected text appears on the screen, it sends keys, two coordinates, it sends key presses, and, you know, two hours later, after all the cases have been handled, uh, you get Mac OS, and it just runs. It took me only so. 30 minutes, but yeah. And I've got something similar implemented for, um, for Windows 11, so you can do the same thing there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm planning on taking this further, because you could put Nix inside and use Nix Darwin and configure that and do the whole thing, right? <laughs> I, I currently also have a Nixos module, which lets you say services.macOS.enable equals true. Oh and it'll just. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I also did the same thing for DOS, MS DOS, uh, Windows 3, <laughs> Windows 3.1, and stuff. And the way this works is that if I do this, it actually goes to uh, BitTorrent, and it just fe it fetches Windows 3 from BitTorrent and performs the installation offline and stuff. And yeah. Uh, the, the BitTorrent comes from archive.org, though, so it's perfectly legal. So. Perfectly <laughs> legal. Yeah. But yeah, again, a network limited demo isn't very going to be very good on this uh, network, so best not to show it off. But you can all run it yourselves, so go ahead and do that. You should have set up a Nix server in order to serve Nix packages to your Nix machine. Yeah, but then it wouldn't show it actually reproducing the thing from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Just bring him NAS. Yeah, exactly. Now how's our dev shell from hell doing? What the hell happened? Yeah, next like show. All right, okay. Dev shell. It's actually dev shells with a plural, right? Right, so we got that dev shell. So we want that dev shell. We'll get rid of Zoom because it's proprietary and I can't, don't feel like dealing with that right now. But yeah. And then we'll have cargo, .NET, and the JDK, and like all these other things. Uh, .NET is not the name of the package. Anyone know what it is? It's the .NET SDK with the version number. Okay. Right, but the, my employer doesn't just need cargo. They need cargo from last year, so I need to go and get an old version of Nix packages. Um, no, it's not impure. So, so we'll go to Nix packages, and then we'll go to 2009. Uh, Nix OS 2009. We'll get the revision. Nix packages slash the revision, which is like from 2020. Right, so we need cargo from 2020. We need .NET SDK 8. We need Zoom. You know what? It's on free. It's fine. We'll just uh, say packages equals importing next packages. Right, so we're going to have a dev shell that gives people .NET, JDK, Cargo from 2020 and Zoom. <laughs> Look, Nix packages used to be a lot smaller, <laughs> like half the size. Nowadays it's 39 megabytes because of all the hashes that are inside of it. Wait, as a uh Yep, building Zoom. All right, our MS-DOS build is working. Let me show you the logs for that, because it takes a screenshot every 10 seconds. Um, I can actually show you it. All right, yeah, so this is the text from the OCR of Windows. So right now, if I become root,
There's the capture. It's just it's doing all of the the installation inside. <laughs> oh no, you can't do that with Kitten. It screws up. Yeah. But yeah, so then it'll just run. Uh, of course, one of the dependencies of Windows 3 is MS DOS, so it creates the dependency graph, and it's like MS DOS gets installed, then Windows depends on that, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Service now, what is that? Uh, it's a, a ticketing tool that they like to say oh, right. is super awesome. It's like a 20 year old Java app. Their customer service is horrible. Okay. They handle what infrastructure and code is, and a bunch of other things. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right, we got the dev shell from hell. We got Zoom. It, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't respond to health. It's like, Oh look, it tried to run Pulse Audio. <laughs> <laughs> How crazy is that? And we got cargo from like years ago. Right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's kind of it. Yeah. So the next plan is to use uh the server. Nice. Oh, th those are the Unreal glasses. Uh Wait, is there someone else speaking in a minute? Yeah. Is this supposed to be someone else speaking? Yeah. No, it's like the talk. Yeah.